Hey boys and girls, it's Sunday evening and ro, ro thought she would like to hear a little bit of the story. She likes to have a treat or two, or three, when she hears stories. Are you ready for a good story, ro, ro? Yeah? You shake? All right, ro, ro. Let's hear the sign of the beaver. You would have been a good dog for a teen. Would you have been a good dog for a teen? Yes, you would have. All right, Ro, Ro, here we go. Chapter 18, over and over. Though he knew the number only too well, Matt counted the notches in his stick, in, in his sticks. He kept hoping that he had made a mistake. Always they were the same. 10 sticks, that meant that August had long gone by. He couldn't remember exactly how many days belonged to each month. But anyway, he reckoned it was the month of September must al almost be over. He only needed to look around him. The maple trees circling the clearing flamed scarlet. The birches and aspens glowed yellow, holding a sunlight of their own even on misty days. The woods had become quieter. Jays still screamed at him and chickadees twittered softly in the trees but the songbirds had disappeared. Twice he had heard a faraway trumpeting that had, long, that had uh, seen long straggles of wild geese, like trailing smoke high in the air, moving south. In the morning when he stepped out of the cabin, the frosty air nipped his nose. The noonday was warm as midsummer, but when he came inside at dusk, he hurried to stir up the fire. There was a chilliness inside of him that was neither the sun nor the fire that had ever reached. It seemed to him that day by day, the shadow of the forest moved closer to the cabin. Why was his family so late in coming? He was troubled too because the autumn weather seemed to have caught a restlessness in a teen. There were days when the Indian boy did not come. He uh, never offered a word of explanation. After a day or two, he would simply walk into the cabin and sit down at the table. He rarely suggested that they hunt or fish together. Day after day, Matt walked through the woods alone, trying to shake the doubts that walked beside him, like his own shadow. As he walked, Matt was careful to cut blazes in the bark of trees. They gave, uh, they gave him courage to walk farther into the forest than he had ever dared before, since he was sure of finding his way back to the cabin. He also watched for Indian signs, and sometimes he was sure that he had detected one. One day, looking up, he saw on a nearby tree the sign of a turtle. Time to turn back, he told himself. He felt secure now in the territory of the beaver. But since he wasn't so certain that a strange people would welcome a white trespasser. As he started to retrace his steps, he heard some distance away the sharp, high-pitched yelp of a dog. It didn't sound threatening, but neither did it sound like the happy, excited bark of a hound that had scented that of a rabbit. It sounded almost like the scream of a child. And when it came again, it died into a low whining, and he remembered the trapped fox. A teen had wanted him to have nothing to do with the turtle trap. But he hesitated, and the sound came again. No matter what a teen had told him, he could not bring himself to walk away from the sound, and warily he made his way through the brush. It was a dog, a scrawny Indian dog, dirt caked and bloody. As Matt moved closer, he, uh, as Matt moved closer, he saw through the blood 
the white streak down the side of its face, and then the chewed ear and the stubby porcupine quills. Only one dog in the world would look like that. It was caught by its foreleg, just as the fox had been, and it was frantic with pain and fear. Its eyes were glazed and white foam dripped from its open jaws. Matt felt his own muscles tense with anger. His mind was made up in an instant. It had been bad enough to leave a fox to suffer. Turtle Triber, no, he was not going to walk away from a teen's dog. Somehow he had to get that dog out of the trap. But how? As he bent down, the dog snapped at him so ferociously that he uh, jumped back. Even if it recognized him, a teen's dog had never learned to trust him. Now it was too crazed to understand that Matt meant to help. Matt sat his teeth, and stooped again. This time, he got his hands on the steel bands of the trap, and he gave a tug. With a deep growl, the dog snapped at him again. Matt started, scraping his hands against the steel teeth. He leaped to his feet and stared at the red gash that ran from his knuckles to his wrist. It was no use, he realized. There was no way he could get that trap open with the dog in this maddened state. Somehow, he would have to find a teen. He began to run through the forest, back over the way he had come, back along the trails he knew, searching his memory for signs he remembered that led to the Indian village. And luck was with him. There was the sign of the beaver cut into a tree. And here were the fallen logs. He was never absolutely sure, but he, was, he knew he walked in the right direction. And after nearly an hour, to his great relief, he came out on the shore of the river. There was no canoe waiting, as there had been when a teen had led him there but the river was narrow and placid. Thank goodness he had grown up near the ocean and his father had taken, taken him swimming from the time he could walk. He left his moccasins hidden under a bush and plunged in. In a few moments he came out dripping within sight of the stockade. He was greeted by a frenzied, barking of dogs. They burst through the stockade and rushed toward him, halting only a few feet away, menacing him so furiously that he dared not take another step. Behind them came a group of girls who quieted the dogs with shrill cries and blows. I have come for a teen, Matt said, when he could make himself heard. The girls stared at her, him, tired, wet, and ashamed of showing his fear of dogs. Matt could not summon up any politeness or dignity. A teen, he repeated impatiently. One girl, bolder than the others, answered him, flaunting her knowledge of the white man's language. A teen not here she told him. Well then, Sackness! Sackness, not here. I'll gone, hunt. Desperately, Matt seized his only remaining chance. A teen's grandmother, he demanded. I must see her. And the girls looked at each other uneasily. Matt pulled back his shoulders and tried to put into his voice the stern authority that belonged to Sackness. It is important, he said. Please show me where to find her. Amazingly, his blustering had an effect. After some whispering, the girls moved back out of his way. 
Come, the, girl, the leading girl ordered, and he followed her through the gate. He was not surprised that she led him straight to the most substantial cl uh, cabin in the clearing. He had recognized on the night of the feast that Sackness was the chief. And now, facing him in the doorway, was a figure even more impressive than the old man. She was an aging woman, gaunt and wrinkled, but still handsome. Her black braids were edged in white. She stood erect, her lips set in a forbidding line. Her eyes brilliant with no hint of welcome. Could he make her understand? Matt wondered in confusion. I'm sorry, ma'am, he began. I know you don't want me to come here, but I need help. A teen's dog is caught in a trap, a steel trap. I tried to open it but the dog won't let me come near it. The woman stared at him. He could not tell whether she understood a word. He started to speak again when the deerskin curtain was pushed aside with a second figure standing in the doorway. It was a girl with long black braids hanging over her shoulders. She was dressed in blue with broad bands of red and white beating. Strange, Matt thought, how much alike they looked, the old woman and the girl standing side by side, so straight and proud. Me, Marie, sister of a teen, the girl said in a soft, low voice. Grandmother not understand. I tell what you say. Matt repeated what he had said, and he waited impatiently while she spoke to the grandmother. The woman listened, and finally her grim lips parted in a single scornful phrase. Aramis Bizwat, she said. Good for nothing, dog. And Matt's awe vanished in anger. Well, tell her, maybe it is good for nothing, he ordered the girl. But a teen is fond of it. And it's hurt. Hurt bad. We've got to get it out of the trap. There was distress in the girl's eyes as she turned again to the grandmother. He could see that she was pleading, that in spite of herself, the old woman was relenting. After a few short words, the girl went into the cabin and came back in a moment, holding in her hand a large chunk of meat, a small blanket folded over her arm. Me go with you, she said. Dog know me. In his relief, Matt forgot the torn hand that he had been holding behind him. Instantly, the woman moved forward and she snatched at it. Her eyes questioned him. Oh, it's nothing, he said hastily. I almost got the trap open. She gave his arm a tug commanding him to follow her. There isn't time, he protested. She silenced him with a string of words of which he understood only the scornful piz -wat. She say, dog not go away, the girl explained. Better you come. Trap, maybe make poison. So having no choice, Matt followed them into the cabin. He saw now that the woman's straight posture had been a matter of pride. She really was very lame. She stooped 
as she walked ahead of him. While she busied herself over the fire, he sat obediently on a low platform and looked about him. He was astonished that the little room, strange and so unlike his mother's kitchen, seemed beautiful. It was very clean. The walls were lined with birch bark and hung with woven mats and baskets of intricate design. The air was sweet with fresh grasses spread on the earth floor. Without speaking, the woman tended him, washing his hand with clean, warm water. From a painted gourd, she scooped a pungent-smelling paste and spread it over the wound, and then bound his hand with a length of clean blue cotton. Thank you, Matt said when she had finished. It feels better. She dismissed him with a grunting imitation of Sockness's good. The girl who had been watching moved swiftly to the door. Matt rose to follow her. The grandmother held out to him a slab of cornbread. He had not realized how hungry he was and he accepted it gratefully. The girl took the lead brushing aside the curious children and the still suspicious dogs. At the river's edge, she untied a small canoe, and Matt stepped into it, thankful for his half-dried clothes uh, would not have to be drenched again. And once on the forest trail, she set the pace, and he did not find it easy to keep up with her swift, silent stride. She was so like a teen, though lighter and more graceful. After a time, Matt, Matt ventured to break the silence. You speak good English, he said. A teen, tell me about you, she answered. You tell him a good story. A teen did not tell me he had a sister. The girl laughed. A teen thinks squaw girl not good for much, she said. A teen only like to hunt. You know, I have a sister too, he told her. She's coming soon. What she named? Sarah. She's younger than you. Marie isn't an Indian name, is it? He asked. Is Christian name. Me, baptized. By father. A teen had never mentioned a priest either. But Matt knew that the French Jesuits had lived with the Indians here in Maine long before the, the English settlers came. Well, when my sister comes... Will you come with a team to see her? he asked. It might be so, she answered politely. However, she sounded as though it would never be. At last, they heard a yelping just ahead of them, and they both began to run. Even in his terror, the dog recognized the girl and he greeted her with a frantic beating of his tail. He gulped at the meat that she handed out to him, but he still would not let either of them touch the trap. The girl had come prepared for this, and she unfolded the blanket that she carried, and she threw it over the dog's head and gathered the folds behind him. And with surprising strength, she held the struggling bundle tightly in her own arms while Matt took the trap in both hands and slowly forced the jaws open. And in a moment, the dog was free, escaping the blanket and bounding away from them on three legs, the fourth paw dangling at an odd angle. I think it's broken, Matt said. 
he was still breathing hard from the last run and from the effort of tugging away the steel jaws. A team mend, the girl said, folding up the blanket as calmly as though she was tidying up a cabin. The dog hobbled slowly after them along the trail, lying down now and then licking his bleeding paw. They made slow progress, and now that the worry was over, Matt was, a worry, was aware of how tired he was. It seemed as though they had been walking back and forth over the trail all day, and the way to the village seemed endless. He was thankful when halfway to the river, he saw a teen approaching swiftly along the trail. My grandmother, send me, he explained. You get dog out? Well, I couldn't do it alone, Matt admitted. A teen stood watching as the dog came limping toward them. Dog very stupid, he said. No good for hunt. No good for smell, turtle smell. What for I take back such foolish dog? Well, his harsh words did not fool Matt for a moment, and nor did they fool the dog. The scruffy tail thumped joyfully against the earth. The brown eyes looked up at the Indian boy in admiration. A teen reached into his pouch and he brought out a piece of dried meat. And then he bent down and very gently he took the broken paw in his hands. Chapter 19 Grandmother, say you must come to village today. A teen announced two days later. Oh, well, that's kind of her, Matt answered. But my hand is just about healed. It doesn't need any more medicine. Not for medicine. Matt waited uncertainly. My grandmother, very surprised, white boy, go long way. For Indian dog, a teen explained. She say, you welcome. So once again, Matt crossed the river to the Indian stockade. This time, though the dogs barked at him and the children stared and giggled, he did not feel like such a stranger. Sockness held out a hand of welcome. A teen's grandmother, did not exactly smile, but her thin lips were less grim. And behind her, a teen sister smiled, but did not speak. The old woman dipped a clam shell ladle into a kettle and filled three bowls with a stew of fish and corn, and then drew back while a teen in Sackness and Matt ate their meals in silence. Neither she nor Marie ate until the men were finished. After the meal, a teen did not hurry him away. He rather grandly played host and led Matt about the village. He was amused when Matt kept stopping every few feet to watch what the women were doing. Matt was filled with curiosity. He knew well enough that a teen was scornful of the squaw work that the boy, that the white boy had to do. But a teen did not have to worry about what he was going to eat the next day. There were so many things that Matt wanted to learn. He observed carefully as two women pounded dried kernels of corn between two rounded stones catching the coarse flour on a strip of birch bark. He marked how they spread berries on the bark so that the sun dried them as hard as pebbles. 
He admired the baskets made out of a single strip of birch bark, bent and fastened at the corners so tightly that water could be boiled inside. Well, I must remember that, he resolved. I could do that for myself if I tried. For a time, a team good-naturedly naturedly answered the questions, but finally he grew impatient of squaw work. He led Matt to a cluster of boys who squatted in a circle in a dirt pathway, absorbed in some noisy game. The boys widened their ring to make room for two more, and Matt crouched awkwardly on his heels to watch them. One after another, they were shaking six smooth bone discs in a wooden bowl and then tossing them out into the ground. Each disc was marked on one side with a band of red paint. Each boy had had a turn. The one who had thrown the most discs to land painted side up was proclaimed the winner and with much gloating he collected from each of the others a number of small sticks. They handed the bowl to Matt. His luck was good. Five of the discs showed red bands, and with laughter and clowning, the others piled up uh, before him a little heap of sticks. What was so exciting about this simple game, he wondered, to cause so much shouting? The bowl went rapidly around the circle and sti the sticks kept changing hands. And presently, he had the answer. One of the boys had no sticks left to pay. And with a mocking groan, he unclasped from under his arm a wide copper band, and he handed it to the winner. Well, so that's it, Matt thought silently. Sooner or later, I am bound to lose too, and when I do, what will they expect for me to forfeit? Well, he did not have to, uh, a long time to wait. At his next turn, every one of his discs landed blank side up, Ruefully, he handed over the last of his sticks that he had won. There was a gleeful shout, and they all waited. What do I have? He thought desperately. Nothing in his pocket but a jackknife. And his very life depended on that knife. Well, then the boy nearest him reached over and uh, jerked roughly at the sleeve of his shirt. Matt pretended not to understand, and so the boy tugged harder. Two of the others got to their fleet feet, plainly ready to tear the shirt right off of his back. A teen made no move to help him. Grimly, he pulled the shirt over his head, and he tossed it to the winner. It served him right, he supposed. His father had always forbidden him to gamble. But what was he going to do without that shirt? It was the only one that he had. So a teen put an end to the game. He leaped to his feet and produced from nowhere a soft ball made out of deer skin. And instantly the others raced off in all directions and they came back carrying thin sticks. One of these was thrust at Matt. It was a curious sort of bat, light and flexible, with a wide, flat curve at the tip. Forgetting his humiliation, Matt suddenly grinned. With a bat in his hand, he could hold his own with any Indian. The boys back in Quincy could have told him that. Eagerly, he joined in the scramble of choosing sides. 
but he had never played a game like this, so fast and merciless. The ball could not be touched by hand or foot. It kept flying through the air by the sticks alone. If it fell to the ground, some player scooped it up with the tip of his bat and sent it spinning again. The Indian boys were bewilderingly quick and skillful, and they wielded their bats with no heed for each other's heads, and certainly not for Matt's. It was no accident, he knew, when an elbow jabs suddenly into his right eye. These boys were putting him to the test, ignoring the blows that fell on his head and shoulders. Matt swung grimly at the whirling ball, missing it over and over, but sometimes feeling satisfyingly thwack of the bat against leather. He was thankful now that he had no shirt. If only he would be wearing a breech cloth instead of his English breeches. But there was no time to be worrying about his clothes. And finally, by pure luck, he sent the ball into the hole in the ground that was marked as the goal. Out of breath and dripping, he grinned as his, as, as his side generously cheered him and whacked his short, sore shoulders. And then with a whoop, they raced all together through the stockade gate down to the river and they went leaping like frogs into the water. Matt floated face down, grateful for the coolness against his burning cheeks. All at once, a brown arm circled his neck and dragged him under. Squirming free, he seized a black head in both hands. And the two boys went under the water together. They came up, grasping, gasping and grinning. And suddenly, Matt was enjoying himself. It was almost as good as being back in Quincy again. The sun had reached the tops of the pines when he went to a teen's cabin to bid the grandmother goodbye. She stood, studying him, and he flushed under her sharp eyes. He must look like quite a sight, he knew. There was a lump as big as a an egg right on his forehead, and his right eye was probably turning black. She turned and she spoke some stern words to a teen. With a shrug, he went out and he returned in a few moments carrying Matt's shirt. They play tricks on you, he said. Joke. <laughs> some joke, Matt retorted. He wanted to refuse the shirt, but he couldn't afford to be proud about the only shirt he had, so he pulled it over his head. Before they left, the old woman gave each of them a slab of cake, heavy with nuts and berries. Her eyes, as she looked at her grandson, were warm and bright. Matt was minded how his mother often looked at him, pretending to be angry with him, but not able to hide that she was mighty fond of him just the same. And suddenly, he felt a sharp stab of homesickness. Outside the cabin, a teen's dog was waiting. He limped after them to the river, and when Matt stepped into the canoe, the dog jumped in after him, and he settled down only a few inches from Matt's knees. He had never will willingly come so close before. A teen noticed and commented, Dog, remember. Was it possible? Matt wondered. Could a dog caught in a trap, even though he was snapped out in pain and fear? 
sense that someone was trying to help him? Could the dog remember that terrible ordeal at all? You couldn't read a dog's mind, but just possibly a dog could read a white boy's mind. Very slowly, Matt reached down and laid his hand on the dog's back, and the dog did not stir or growl. Gently, Matt scratched behind the ragged ear, and gradually, against the bottom of the canoe, the thin tail began to thump in a contented rhythm. At the opposite bank, a teen watched Matt climb out of the canoe, but he did not follow. Apparently, this was as far as he intended to go. As Matt hesitated, he lifted his hand. It occurred to Matt that this was a compliment. Without saying a word, a teen was acknowledging that Matt could now find his own way through the forest. It would be growing dark. He would have to walk fast or he would not be able to mark or to read the signs along the trail. He was very tired. The bump on his forehead was throbbing. He was sore from head to toe and his eye was almost swollen shut. But to his surprise, deep inside, he was happy. Was it because a teen's dog had finally trusted him? No. More than that had changed. He had passed some sort of test, not by any means by, with flying colors. He had plenty of bruises to remind him of that. But at least he had not disgraced a teen. He felt satisfied. And for the first time since his father had left him, he did not feel so alone in the forest. The end of chapter 19.